Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our latest blog, um, or, sorry, webinar. Uh, it's one of those days, I guess. Um, my name is Griffin Thorne. I'm a partner at Harris Lewoski, a uh, blogger for the Canada Law Blog. And today I've got with me Hirsch Jane. I'm going to read a bio. Uh, Hirsch is the founder of Ananda Strategy, strategy consultancy, which advises leading cannabis brands, retailers, ancillary technology businesses, and venture capital funds in the cannabis industry. Hirsch also serves as the vice chair of the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce and is on the board of directors of California Normal. Uh, prior to working in cannabis, Hirsch was the global policy lead at Airbnb in San Francisco. Before that, he worked as an engagement manager at McKinsey & Company in New York City. Hirsch is a BA in philosophy from UC Berkeley and a JD from Harvard Law School. Um, for a little bit of background on, on me, I, like I said, I'm a partner at this firm. Uh, you can find my work on the Canada Law Blog. I, I blog weekly, if not more often. I represent clients uh, in a lot of different industries, but a lot of clients in the cannabis industry since 2018, doing corporate and transactional work, as well as regulatory compliance and other types of work. Uh, I first came across Hirsch. We, we actually worked together on a competitive licensing application uh, probably four or five years ago, and we've stayed in touch. I know that he's one of the leading voices in the space. and. Um, you know, I, I write often about the problems in California's cannabis industry, uh, and I like to focus on specific data points. I noticed a couple of months ago that Hirsch also does the same thing, but sort of on different areas. And so I thought it might be a fun idea to have the two of us here. We could sort of hash out what we think is wrong with the industry and whether it could be saved um, and, you know, how we would like, ideally like that to happen. So um, with that in mind, what we've done is we've created sort of a series of um, topics that we'll, we'll go through today and uh, hit them one by one. And then at the end, uh, we'll leave some for Q&A, of course, but uh, we'll offer some potential solutions that we might also have. Um, the, the first sort of general topic I want to talk about is the legal and regulatory background in the state of California. And, you know, for those who aren't as familiar with things and sort of the problems we face, I think Hirsch would probably agree with me. A lot of it ties back into the fact of how it's regulated here and how the law works. So I'll start by asking Hirsch, uh, Hirsch, how is cannabis regulated in California? Yeah, and thanks, Griffin. And first of all, thank you for having me. And thanks to Harris Slowowski for, for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, you know, at its highest level, you know, there's one regulatory agency in, in California at the state level. That's the Department of Cannabis Control. Um, I point that out because in the initial years of adult use sales in California, there were actually three separate regulatory agencies that would regulate different parts of the supply chain, the, the most prominent being the Bureau of Cannabis Control. But in 2021, those three regulatory agencies were consolidated into a single one known as the DCC. The rationale of that was to sort of provide better quote unquote customer service and to streamline different processes. So that's been the main agency for a few years. And then there are also, of course, agencies at the local level that cannabis operators have to engage with. So, for instance, if you're based in the city of L.A., you have to engage with the Department of Cannabis Regulation, which is the local regulatory agency. So those are sort of the, the dual sort of agencies that operators uh, have to contend with. Right. And I, I think another sort of fundamental aspect of this is that our, our law in California that governs cannabis at the state level was passed by a voter initiative back in 2016. Um, Hirsch, do you want to talk about what the effect of a voter initiative as opposed to a state that might have, let's say, adopted a cannabis program legislatively by through the act of the state's Congress? Yeah, no, I, I think that's really important. And I think a little bit of history is worth remembering here. So folks may remember that in 2010, California actually had an adult use initiative that narrowly failed, uh, Prop 47 because of some opposition from local government groups and from you know uh, police agencies. And so that was a couple of years before Colorado and Washington were the first two states. And I think that narrow loss really colored the approach to Prop 64. So Prop 64 was the initiative that passed in, in 2016 and it had a lot of different component parts, but I think the, the organizing principle was a desire to appease you know, different different interest groups that were out there. So for instance, you know, Prop 64, as I'm sure we'll talk about during this conversation, featured a very high tax structure, right? That was in part meant to sell this to the voters as a tax revenue generator. Um, those taxes were also earmarked for specific groups. 
right? Some of them public health groups as a way of getting those groups on board. Um, similarly, Prop 64 had really deeply embedded local control as a way of winning over local government groups and, and police agencies. And so I think that's the way to think about Prop 64, maybe not the best policy, but a series of compromises designed to appease different groups. And to answer your question, we have seen in the eight years since Prop 64 passed that there's a lot of aspects of Prop 64 that are really problematic for achieving its goal of establishing a functional legal market. And as you alluded to, because this was passed by voter initiative, the ability to modify that law is much more difficult. You know, specifically in the state legislature, a two thirds supermajority is required to modify that law. And so I'm sure there's much more we could say, but at its highest level, I would say, the problems with Prop 64 are known problems. The problems with California cannabis are known problems. You know, problems like local control, problems like tax reductions. And we have seen bills introduced in the state legislature to deal with those problems, such as a bill introduced by Phil Ting to require jurisdictions to allow cannabis access or bills introduced by people like Rob Bonta to reduce taxes. And so I think these are known problems and bills have been introduced to solve those problems. But because a two thirds vote is required in the state legislature to get those bills passed, we're kind of at this impasse where we have not been able to solve these very knowable problems. And again, like you said, that's in part because we passed this via a, a voter initiative that is much more hard, uh, much more difficult to amend going forward. Right. And so I think part of the problem is we're stuck with the law that you know, we, it was made as a compromise. I mean, look, Prop 64 passed was like pretty narrow margin. I don't, I don't know the specifics, but it was not a landslide for sure. A, a lot of people forget that outside the, the big cities here, the, the, the voters are a lot different. And so um, a lot of provisions that were intended to sort of be compromised for the positions have, uh, have really been detrimental to the industry in the last uh, six, seven years. And so... <clears throat> that means we're essentially stuck with a lot of these things i mean anybody who's familiar with this getting another voter initiative through will be difficult if not impossible and getting the legislature to agree on on a big change is also going to be difficult if not impossible so i mean even small things talk uh, in terms of reforms here so you know we're stuck with an imperfect system and, and that shapes a lot of the issues here I, you know I, I should also mention something hirsch talked about which is dual licensing uh, if you're not in California and you're, you might be in another state and just watching this out of curiosity, some states don't have this problem or it's much different. But here you have to have a license from the city and you have to have a license from the state. And in general, the local process is much more lengthy and cumbersome than the state process because cities, I mean, it's all over the map, right? Some cities, it's, it's fairly routine and easy. Others, it's, you know, years worth of construction. Uh, anyone who's worked with a bunch of businesses, I'm sure Hirsch has worked for his too, has, has seen people take three, four years to start from applying to operating because of these local processes and how onerous they can be. California is also unique in that we have environmental protection laws that, that make it just really hard to, to operate in some cases. So um, dual licensing means that you have to do both of these processes. In some cases, you have to go through a lot of hoops locally before you can even apply for your state license. And so it just makes the process much more difficult and, and notably much more expensive. Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to budget a year or more in a lot of cases until you can start operating, which means a year of paying money to a landlord. You have to have a lease, a year of uh, paying all kinds of expenses where there's no income coming back. So that just makes it hard for anybody to operate particularly small businesses and social equity type businesses who just don't have those kinds of resources. So our system is sort of stacked against the, the small business owner. And I, I mentioned CEQA, which is our environmental law, which just, it, it is becoming harder and harder for businesses to comply, especially ones that have to go through major build outs um, or, you know, businesses that outdoor cannabis farms, things like that, where there might be water issues too, that are very uh, difficult to navigate in this state. Um, so with that background in mind and kind of where things stand, I think one of the biggest complaints I see, and I mean, Hirsch, correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong on this, is just over-regulation. And I think a complaint that I've personally heard and that I've made on my blog a lot is that there are areas where the DCC or specifically cities have stepped in to regulate 
more than what they have the minimum thresholds to do or, or requirement to do under state law and impose additional regulations that often just make it impossible to do business. Um, and so I think that, you know, the first roadblock to a lot of businesses who are suffering right now is trying to figure out a way to, for the state to, to, to relook at those regulations. I mean, um, two that come to mind immediately are the prohibition on selling cannabis past 10 p.m., which from what I can tell is not anywhere in Prop 64 or any other state law. And really, it just guarantees that the illegal market's going to thrive because if somebody wants cannabis at 11, 1 a.m., whatever, they're just going to call an illegal source, right, or go to an illegal dispensary, which are everywhere in the state. Uh, another one is the, the restrictions around changes of ownership, a lot of which don't track specifically to the statute and make business sales particularly challenging. And I've seen the rules applied completely night and day to different businesses. So these are areas where I think the regulators can and absolutely should take a hard look at the rules and say, look, if this doesn't, it's not strictly required given this, the amount of suffering and pain in the industry, we might want to think about getting rid of it. Um, which kind of brings us to the next point, which is sales performance. And this one is one where Hirsch is really the expert between us. And I want to defer to him on most of this. So I'll, Hirsch, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, when we talk about sales performance, we're talking about the amount of revenue generated, the amount of sales at the state level. We have data now, uh, sort of limited data, but we have some data and we can compare it to other states. So how does California's per capita sales compare to other mature adult use states? Like maybe totally. Quickly, before I get to sales, I just want to say I agree with so much of what you just said. And I just kind of want to underscore how much of a pain point those local government processes are. Just a couple things I'll, I'll sort of highlight that you said and just want to flag. A lot of these local governments are really understaffed. And so when you empower them with a licensing authority, but they don't have the staff to process those those license applications, that becomes really problematic. And a lot of them don't have expertise in cannabis too. So even if they decide they want to pass an ordinance, it can take them years to develop the knowledge in order to pass an ordinance. So I completely agree with that. And I also want to underscore what you said, which is to say that ends up hurting small and equity businesses the most. I think often in California, we have this conversation about whether we're fulfilling our promise to develop an equi a racially equitable market, right? A, a, a market of small businesses. And I think it's important to understand the link between the regulatory constraints that exist and our inability to see that market through, right? If you're waiting for years before opening a business, um, it, you know, it's not likely you're able to sustain that if you're a small or minority business. So, you know, that's just a, a different way of recapping what, what you just said and that I'm in agreement with. Uh, on the sales question specifically, you know, I think there are different sales figures that are thrown out about California cannabis. I'll refer to you know, the quarter one data that was recently released by the CDTFA. And there are two different figures there. One of them is, is called taxable sales and one of them is cannabis sales. Now, taxable sales includes non-cannabis goods, right, um, like accessories. But if we're focusing specifically on cannabis sales, in the first quarter of 2024, California sold about a billion dollars of legal cannabis. Now, those numbers will, will rate, rise a little bit as more returns come in, but that gives you a rough sense of where the market is today. It's approximately a four, maybe you can say a four and a half billion dollar market. I point that out because previously, you know, a, a few years ago, you would often see headlines saying California was a six billion dollar market, you know, when, when it was a little bigger. And I think that number was a little inflated, um, you know, including things like uh, like non-cannabis goods. And so. I think you can say roughly California has a four and a half billion dollar market. And to answer your question, how does this compare to other states? You know, California has, objectively speaking, the lowest per capita uh, cannabis sales of any what I would call mature adult use state. And I'll just define mature roughly by, you know, someone who legalized cannabis more than four years ago, for, for example. Right. Um, California has the lowest per capita cannabis sales. And, you know, we, we can compare it to to other markets. And so if we took Montana, for example, right, Montana is a pretty small state. It's a state of one million people. Last year, they generated three hundred and twenty five million in cannabis sales. And so, you know, if you just do some kind of quick math, right, Montana is one million people. California is 40 million people. It's 40 times its size. If California were performing on par with Montana, it would be generating 13 billion dollars in legal sales as opposed to, you know, four and a half uh, today. I think another you know, apt comparison is uh, Michigan, right? Um, so Michigan in March of 2024 um, generated $290 million in sales. And again, not to, to make this into you know, sort of a, a, a math 
you know, conversation, but, you know, Michigan has 10 million people. It's about a quarter of California, right? California has 40, Michigan has 10. And so if California were performing the way that Michigan was, it would be generating 14 billion um, in, in sales. And so um, I, I think that's relevant. And I'll just kind of conclude by saying, you know, first on Michigan specifically, some people will point out that it borders a number of prohibition states such as Ohio. And I, I think that's fair, right? Some of that is being fed by cross-border traffic in places like Indiana and Ohio. Although I would remind people that California gets 280 million tourists each year. And so I imagine some of those legal cannabis sales are, are, are also coming from, from tourists. And so those are the numbers. And, you know, just to kind of put a fine point on it, we have been accustomed to this phrase, you know, California is the largest cannabis market in the world. And, you know, I'm, I've, I've lived here my entire life, as, as I think you have too. I'm, I'm proud of the state. Um, but I think that's, that's misleading in the context of the per capita numbers. And well, I'm sure we'll unpack in a second, what is the driver of that poor performance? The way I think about it is that's sort of like saying, California has the most Republicans in the country, which is like, yeah, that's true. That's because one out of every eight people lives in California. There's 40 million people here. Um, so that statement, while factually true, is somewhat misleading and obscures the, the, the fact that the legal market is just drastically underperforming compared to states that are not even synonymous with cannabis culture. Right. Uh, when we talk about these other states, though, uh, like Michigan, Montana and things like that, I think you do have to factor that travel into it, which probably makes the numbers even more different because I don't I don't I'm just guessing here, but I doubt there's a huge tourism industry to those places specifically for cannabis, whereas here. I mean, I, I, I do think there is something to California cannabis and people probably come here for that reason. Go see places where it's grown. And uh, so there that I mean, those numbers are, are seem to be devastating compared to what we we're seeing at the beginning of COVID, right, where the numbers were through the roof. Um, how, over the last couple of years, what do you think the trend is? I mean, obviously you said it was 6 million a couple of years ago. Do you have any insights or punches as to why it might be dropping so much? Yeah, and I think Griffin, you're really right to point out COVID. I, I think the way to think about the trajectory of the California market is that <clears throat> it's been on a steady downward decline um, over the past three years. Of course, you know, it'll vary based on seasonality, but it's been on a steady decline since July of 2021, which is when the lockdowns ended in California. And look, I think most people familiar with cannabis are aware that, you know, during COVID, right, cannabis was deemed an essential business. People were getting tons of free money. There weren't other ways for people to spend that money because they were in their house. So, you know, cannabis was at its zenith. And I would say that was the most optimistic moment in California cannabis in early 2021, right, when we were probably north of a $5 billion market, probably not quite at six, right? Um, even though there were reports to that effect, because again, that would include uh, taxable sales. Um, and so I think what has happened in California is, you know, what has happened in many other states, right? After the COVID high wore off, sales started to decline. But the challenge, uh, the, the way I would think about it is COVID kind of obscured the structural challenges in the California market. And once COVID went away, those challenges started to reveal themselves again. And I would say those two primary challenges um, are one, just the tax structure, the fact that legal cannabis is not cost competitive with illegal cannabis in the state. And there's a long standing and very sophisticated illegal market here. And so that price differential just drives consumers to the illegal market. So that's one of them. And perhaps, you know, the, the other driver, right, of, of the decline in performance or the stagnation um, is the fact that we have not really seen retail expansion across the state. You know, we were just talking about Michigan before. If you were to look at sort of a time series map of Michigan, right, over its five, six years of adult new sales, and to see new stores popping up in the state, it would be an interesting graphic, right? You would see new stores kind of popping up across the state, which has driven its increased sales. In California, we have not seen that, again, because of the, the local government issues that we were talking about before, that even when cities pass ordinances, new new retailers haven't, haven't opened. And so um, that's what I would say is, is driving the, de the decline, right? COVID obscured those challenges. And, um, yeah, that, that's, um, those are sort of what I would say the main things are. And may, maybe the final thing I'll note is, you know, we were just talking about how, hey, it's now maybe a four and a half billion dollar market today. So perhaps it's declined, let's just say roughly 20% over the past few years. The other thing to consider is that, you know, there are, although retail growth hasn't been, you know, rambunctious, there, ha there have been a couple hundred more dispensaries that have opened up in that time who are fighting for that smaller pie. And so that shows you that the average store maybe is generating you know, 50, 60% of the revenue they were generating uh, during COVID. Yeah, it's, I mean, those are all good points. I think 
in my experience working with cannabis businesses, COVID actually in some senses did more harm than good. I mean, I remember in early 20, late 2019, there were a lot of businesses suffering and for some of the reasons we've already talked about, some other reasons we'll get into, but there were just a lot of businesses that were suffering and were probably on the verge of insolvency. And COVID just pumped in so much cash into the industry because people were staying home in this state. There were lockdowns. Uh, it was one of the few things you could, you could go out and get. And so it just pumped a lot of money into the industry. And a lot of these businesses that maybe didn't have great business models or just weren't, for whatever reason, were, were not doing well, got a second wind and money wasn't, it was spent in, you know, in some cases irresponsibly, uh, you know, investments dried up over the last few years significantly. We just don't see a lot of investments today like we did back in 2018, early 2019. And, you know, there was a lot of spending and businesses are now, there's a collapse, right? Uh, this is probably something we'll get back into. But I mean, I think COVID ended up just kicking the can down the road in a weird way that should have been predictable. I mean, people should have understood better that it wasn't going to last forever, but um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was an interesting experiment. And then you add things like the, the fires in 2020 that that destroyed a lot or affected a lot of the outdoor farms and pushed indoor prices up. I mean, it's all kinds of weird stuff. But um, totally, it's it to show you can't really, you never really know what's going to happen. Uh, Hirsch, you previewed a couple of points that we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, I want to talk about taxes. Um, taxes, we have sort of touched on. Um, what makes can California cannabis interesting is, uh, or maybe that's the wrong word, uh, frustrating, I guess, a better word, is that the, the way it's taxed. Um, the federal level, there's, there's something called 280E in the Internal Revenue Code, which prohibits most standard deductions for cannabis businesses. Um, that is potentially going away if cannabis is rescheduled. We did get some questions about rescheduling and whether it's going to happen this year. I don't, nobody really knows at this point, um, uh, but if the effect of rescheduling would be 280E goes away from that point forward. But that's just a federal issue, right? So businesses also pay a state tax and a local tax. At the state level, we had in our law something called the cultivation tax that was charged on cultivation and an excise tax of 15% charged on the sales. And initially it was set up in a way um, that I never really understood, but that the cultivators and the retailers didn't pay the tax. They, they gave the money to the distributor who paid the tax, um, or at least they were supposed to, right? Did that actually happen? A lot of times, no. And, and what ended up happening as a result is that a lot of distributors got massively behind on taxes and had to help people negotiate payment plans with the state. It's, it, it's a mess. Um, the, ta the cultivation tax was done away with in July of 2023, and the excise tax was moved from distribution to retail, which... Um, I want to ask Hirsch about um, in a second. And then at the same time, there's cities, you know, when you have your license in, you know, San Diego, San Francisco, whatever, they're going to charge a tax on the local business too. And it's generally gross receipts tax. So a percentage of the revenue that the business generates, um, I've seen it as high as 10%, which is wild if you think about it, 10% of pre-tax income. And uh, there's some cities I've seen that charge tax on out of city operators who do business in the city. So there's a lot of different sources. For, and this is like just leaving aside general income tax, sales and use tax, things like that. There's just tax to the gills here. And so um, how does this first compare to other states like that you from? Yeah, I mean, um, California has amongst the highest uh, cannabis taxes of any state uh, in the country. Um, now, there are a couple other states that people will point out also have high cannabis taxes. You know, people will point out that Washington has a 37 percent tax, you know, all in and Illinois has high taxes. But I think when you actually do the math, California has the highest tax burden of any state in the country just because of the way that taxes are calculated and the local discretion that, that you were talking about. And there's so many layers of taxation here, it's almost kind of hard to tick through all of them. Um, you know, first, you know, we can just compare, you mentioned local taxes, right? So you're absolutely right. California's um, local jurisdictions charge taxes on cannabis sales. They have their local excise tax. 
And what's remarkable is there's no limit on the amount of tax that they can impose there. And that is striking in comparison with other states. You know, there are other states out there like New Jersey and Massachusetts. These are liberal states. These are states that often tax very highly and they limit the amount that you can tax at the local level to 3%. And just to give you some context on how out of step, you know, sort of California is, people may know that in Massachusetts, that 3% tax known as an impact fee is now suffering under legal challenges as not being justified, right? As potentially being extorted. So it's notable that in Massachusetts, a 3% local tax is considered so outrageous, it's, it's suffering from legal challenges. But in California, it's hard to find a single jurisdiction with that low of a tax. And look, you mentioned there's tons of uh, cities with 10% tax rates out there. There absolutely are. And some of these are home to some of the most retailers in the state, right? The city of Los Angeles that has a quarter of dispensaries um, in the state of California has a 10% tax rate. The city of San Jose, right? Another major cannabis market has a 10% tax rate. So yes, taxes are really high um, at the local level. And you know they're also very high uh, at the state level. There's a 15% state excise tax. That excise tax could actually potentially or likely increase to 19% next year, which would be devastating. And I'm sure we, we can talk about that more. Um, so that's also quite high. Uh, California in general has a much higher sales tax than is imposed in other states, right? In many other states in the country, the all-in sales tax is about half of what it is uh, in, in California. So um, that's also remarkably high. And again, to compare those figures with what um, other states, you know, consider that uh, in, in Michigan, you know, which we were talking about earlier, uh, there is an all-in 10% tax between the state and, and the local level. And even once, you know, you, you factor in um, even once you factor in the sales tax, it's about 16%, you know, which is, which is, you know, a, a fraction of what, what California is. Um, Missouri, right, has a 6% state tax and a maximum of, of 3% local tax. So not to be later the point, but California has much higher taxes than other states uh, in the country. And when you consider that it has a longstanding and sophisticated illicit market, you know, you don't need to be an economist to understand why most consumers continue to patronize um, the, the illegal market. And so, I, you know, as, as was said at the outset, like these are very knowable problems. These are very well known uh, problems. And that tax burden is just driving people to the illegal market. And look, there, there's much more we could say on this. We could also talk about compounding, right? The way in which California calculates its taxes, it taxes on top of taxes, which are, you know, which is practices that are illegal in other states. And so, you know, the actual effective tax burden in California is, is much higher um, for that reason. Oftentimes, you know, if we talk about the city of LA, the city and the state will fight, you know, about who is the, the last taxer. The city wants to, to tax you based on, on, on the amount that's inclusive of the state taxes and vice versa. So it's a really kind of absurd Kafka-esque uh, situation uh, that, that we have here in California. And then, you know, finally, I'll also note in most other states, uh, you know, you are not taxed if you're a medical cannabis patient. That is now the norm in most states that medicine ought not be taxed. But in California, it's much more difficult to get that kind of an exemption. You have to have a specific type of card issued by a county, and then you're only immune from some of the um, some of the the taxes, not not the 15% state excise tax. So um, th that's the tax structure. And then you know maybe I'll just again state the obvious. The profound irony of this is this very punitive, multi-layered uh, tax structure has led to declining tax receipts uh, over time. Uh, because the legal market has stepped in. Yeah, um, that's, these are all good points. Um, I think that the, I am noticing there's comments. I didn't see them before. Uh, I'll try to read them and, and try to incorporate some questions on the next round. But um, a couple of things that I think about this is, you know, rescheduling at the federal level is going to change the federal tax burden, which will be great. I think that it's going to increase investment into the industry because people aren't going to be as spooked knowing that there's going to be essentially little to no profits. The problem with rescheduling and, and doing that is that you're not, there's going to be no incentive for states and localities to change their aggressive, and aggressive is like an understatement, um, tax practices. Why are they going to do that? And um, specifically, the promise with cannabis taxes was that they'd be used for a very specific reason at the state level here. And it was earlier this year or last year that Newsom just took a hundred million out of the fund to, to use for, you know, balancing the budget. You know, that's a loan, right? It's never going to be given back. Uh, being cynical about this a little bit, but 
that's what's going to happen. So there's really little incentive to change anything at the state level. And at the local level, it's kind of the same deal. There is one bill that's winding its way through the state house, which is uh, SC 1059. And it's a pretty simple concept. It's going to say that if you calculate gross receipts as, as a city or county, uh, so that city of LA taxing retailers at 10% uh, of gross receipts, you have to factor out excise tax. You can't include that. So you, it's going to try to eliminate that compounding issue, which is great, uh, but it's not, you know, it's a drop in the bucket of what needs to happen. Real, realistically, what needs to happen to make these businesses whole is to cap local gross receipts tax to a specific to a very small amount, like maybe one or two percent, and uh, severely reduce the excise tax burden. And I've seen people float the idea of like things like bailouts for the industry. I don't even think that's necessary. I think the state just needs to essentially waive some of the tax debt, that, and then that's that's effectively the bailout. I, I, I mean, this is something we didn't talk about yet. But if you are a day late in paying your cannabis taxes in the state of California here. By law, they have to charge you a 50% penalty. And then that's on top of the 10% penalty that's not related to cannabis specifically. And then you see things like interest and penalties. So if you owe $100,000 uh, for excise tax payment to the Department of uh, uh, CDTFA, the uh, Department of Tax, and uh, I always forget this one, um, and, they, and you're uh, literally one day late, you'll get a bill for 160 something thousand dollars right? Because it'll be 50% of the principal plus 10% plus interest and fees and whatever else, um, which is insane. I mean, it's, it's truly insane when you, these businesses, a lot of times are deciding whether to pay employees or, or pay the state, and then they get hit with that. And I'll caveat to the states, uh, you know, for the state that like, they'll, they'll be pretty good about negotiating payment plans, and there's ability to ask for waivers and things of that nature. But like why put people in that position in the first place of having such massive and insane uh, tax policy that's really not tethered to any sort of rational policy decision. I mean, a 50% penalty is just it's ludicrous. So uh, that's another thing that I think if the state got rid of, um, it wouldn't even have to necessarily raise taxes, but just work with people on coming up with realistic solutions to these problems rather than just keep tightening the, the corkscrews on, on the industry. Um, totally. Yeah. And Do you have any just, that on? But based on something you mentioned, I mean, Griffin, you talked about tax debt. I think it's really worth underscoring, right? Um, so, you know, recently um, it became known that 15% of retailers in California cannabis are in default on their taxes. That was actually a public records request that I submitted with one of my clients. Um, there's more than $700 million in outstanding debt, um, at least in California cannabis. So I think that is, you know, just to underscore how big the, the sort of tax issue and deficit is there. The second thing I'll point out is, and you were kind of mentioning this earlier, right? So there's a lot of operators that um, are in deep debt, right? Many of these are social equity operators that the, the state made a, a great emphasis in trying to support. Um, I, I guess I want to point out that, you know, some people will note, hey, this is capitalism. You know, a lot of businesses fail, right? Why should ca you know, cannabis be immune from this larger trend that businesses fail? And I think that's fair, right? Like there's many California cannabis businesses that have failed. There's more that will fail. And there's a way to look at that and say, hey, this is capitalism. That's how things go. But I think that's at odds with the state professing to care about things like creating a small business landscape that is diverse, caring to, you know, caring about things like racial equity. I think to the extent that political leaders are getting cachet out of trying to promote a certain vision of a market, it's not unreasonable to highlight the structural issues that are leading to failures in those demographics in the market. So um, I, I think that's worth pointing out as well. And the, the final point I wanted to make, you know, you mentioned rescheduling. I think we could spend this entire webinar talking about rescheduling. I'll simply, and I'm, you know, as you said, this is an unprecedented issue. You know, you will find very sophisticated legal experts with different views on this issue. So, you know, I, I can't claim to know what's going to happen, but I'm cautiously optimistic that, um, you know, uh, you know, a rescheduling rule could be finalized before the end of the year. And as you mentioned, that would lower the, the tax burden for California cannabis businesses. And look, that would increase the, the the universe of business models that are feasible in the California cannabis market. For instance, you know, I was reading a report in Green Market Report today, uh, today, an article which suggested, you know, more California cannabis operators are going vertical because they need to do so to preserve their margins to be sustainable. Arguably, you wouldn't need to do that in a world where your federal tax burden was, was lower. So I, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out, although I don't think it'll be sort of the salvation of the industry. And the final thing I'll note, you know, just because we're talking about rescheduling, 
you know, the, the profound irony to me is this should be California's moment, right? The federal government is essentially acknowledging that the experiment that California started three decades ago was true, right? California in 96 gave birth to the idea that cannabis is medicine. And, you know, this really validates the idea that the future happens in California first, right? And so there's a profound irony that, you know, 30 years later, when the federal government is catching up to California's wisdom about the utility of cannabis, um, California can no longer say it, it treats cannabis as medicine because it taxes it like a vice, right? And so there's just a, a profound tension in where we are at at the federal level and in California's tax policies. Yeah. I mean, the law was, what was it called? The Control, Regulate, and Tax of, of Adult Use of Marijuana Act, right? So it's that's how it's usually sold to, to voters is we're going to just, this is a money maker for us. And it, it almost never turns out to be the case, no matter where you look. Uh, I want to I want to just interrupt our flow of things to get to some questions here. We got one uh, about uh, elaborating on the potential increase in excise tax. Yeah, right now it's fifteen percent of sales, and it's going to go up to nineteen percent uh, potentially next year, unless that's changed. And that just means you four percent higher excise tax, which means higher cost to the consumer and higher effect on on businesses. We should also just note that I mean we're going to come back to the illegal market in a second, but if you apples putting aside any other factor about the legal versus legal market just taxes alone just taxes alone the illegal market doesn't pay taxes right so you can make a product that is significantly cheaper uh and i, I mean i've talked to a lot of people over the years who say i don't care i pay less what what's the difference right and no uh you know knowledge campaign by the state which they've done about buying from the legal market is going to persuade people when there's that big of a price differential. So if they really were serious about combating the illegal market, I think taxes would be one of the, the biggest, probably top three things that the state should do uh, to do that. We also had a question about um, H, I'm sorry, AB2223, which is a bill to allow hemp within the licensed cannabis supply chain. We're a weird state. We don't do that here uh, currently. We Those markets are completely separated. Lots of other states, they intermingle. Um, I, as far as, I haven't been paying as close attention to that one, but I think it's been winding its way through the legislature. So uh, if so, that just opens up more business for the industry. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to get into that and write about it on our blog in the next couple of weeks. But um, I, I did write about it when it was first proposed, but a lot of times in the state, there's just a million proposals and they don't really go anywhere. So. Uh, this one actually does look like it might be going somewhere, so I'll, I'll try to write on it again. And then um, we had a question about will rescheduling be delayed indefinitely? The way that this works is that the DEA puts out a notice of proposed rulemaking and they publish it on the Federal Register. There's some time to uh, receive comments from the public, and then the agency decides whether to make a final rule or amend the rule and then go through another round of notice and comment. So it could take longer. Nobody really knows exactly. I I mean, it's weird to me to think that it wouldn't happen at this point, that rescheduling would just, they'd say, yeah, we, we changed our position, but would it be this year or next year or something like that? I, I think it's hard to say. Um, obviously, there's a lot out there by way of opposition to this. Uh, there's groups that are lobbying very hard uh, and submitting comments against it. So if you have an interest in this topic, I mean, there's a there's a way to voice that with the agency right now and try to have your voice heard. So I don't want to jump back into the, the topic and, and talk more about the retail landscape, which I think is another area that Hirsch alluded to this already. It's very different from a state like Michigan um, or many other states. But why is why is California different? Hirsch? What What's going on with retail here? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to note is that, you know, California likely needs, uh, you know, at least 4,000 dispensaries to serve the legal market. You know, that's the number of dispensaries it would have if they're on par, you know, per capita with Colorado or with Oregon and other mature states. Uh, so that's the number of dispensaries that California needs. Um, right now, California has um, about 1,000, you know, about 1,250 dispensaries. So it has about a third of the dispensaries uh, that uh, it, it needs. And so, that is one of the main drivers of the illicit market in California. The fact that there's not a ton of retail outlets that um, are out there. And, you know, why are there so few dispensaries in California? I think it boils down to local control. Now, let's really unpack what that means, right? So there's 482 cities in California, about 340 of them. So about 70% of them voted for Prop 64. 
you are right, Griffin, that there's a lot of political, you know, diversity in the state. But, you know, way back in 2016, 70% of the cities had a majority vote for Prop 64, which is pretty remarkable, right, um, eight, eight years ago. And so I think you can say Californians back then support legal cannabis. Now, despite that fact, there's only a retail cannabis business open in about one out of three cities in California today despite the fact that 70% of them voted uh, for, for Prop 64. There's about 150 cities that have a retail cannabis business uh, open open today. And so that's the issue, which is, which is local control. Um, and that is that cities in California have the ability to, to ban cannabis businesses. Most of those cities continue to ban cannabis businesses, especially retail businesses. And here elected officials are not being responsive to, to their uh, constituency. And, you know, I, I think this is a point that's really worth unpacking, right? If you think about local control on its face, it's a principle that seems reasonable, right? Which is a community saying, hey, like we want to have some say in what businesses are in our community. You know, the people should govern, right? What, what happens in their community. And so I think this, this principle has a lot of support on its face. But in practice, elected officials are ignoring the will of their constituents because they have much more to fear from the vocal minority that imposes cannabis than the majority who supports it. And, you know, Griffin, I'm thinking of really specific examples here. You know, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm thinking about Mountain View, right, a town that passed an ordinance through the process, right, to allow legal cannabis that voted overwhelmingly for Prop 64. But then hundreds of people, many of whom did not even live in Mountain View, were bused into a city council meeting to make outlandish claims to city council members about what would happen if cannabis were to pass. So I think it's important to note that local control is often framed as a democratic um, issue or a democratic principle. But in practice, it allows a, a very it's very anti-democratic. It allows an, a, a you know sort of a vocal minority to block cannabis businesses. And, um, you know, I, I, I think in there Hirsch, because i have a, a point on that one which is that a lot of times local control just means that the city council in a city uh or some some department within the city is making decisions that may be very different from what the voters wanted right so that bill that you talked about that was introduced right 2020 was going to say hey look if your voters approve Mount, uh, uh, prop 64 by a majority in this in you know city x then you have to have at least a certain amount of dispensaries which seems democratic, but it was like viciously opposed by by cities. And, and I, you know, the, this is undemocratic, right? When you have a, a city council, I mean, I guess they, they are elected, obviously, but when, there's, when they are making decisions that, you know, if you look at the will of the people in those cities is just drastically different. So that was the, the uh, thing I think people didn't appreciate when they were putting Malkerson together. 64, I always get the, the acronyms mixed up. Um, and so, you know, they, uh, it's just shaken out to be a pretty untenable situation. Totally. I mean, I, I think that's, that's so true. And, 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 you know, not to get too wonky here, but imagine a world in which it was really easy to kick this decision to the voters. Like, what if that's what local control looked like in California, which is like, okay, this passed, you know, if you voted for it, then maybe you have another automatic referendum where your citizens get to vote on whether you want cannabis businesses in, in your city. Right. But instead the bureaucratic obstacles to putting something on the ballot, for example, are so high and you can only do so every two years that, you know, there's a way for local, there would have been a way for local control to more accurately reflect the will of people. But as you just pointed out, it reflects the will of these five people on, on city council, who, as I mentioned, are often not incentivized to do what, what most people want. So I think that's one part of local control. But Griffin, I think the other part of local control that's important is what I would call, you know, just like bureaucratic roadblocks. There are many cities that have passed an ordinance, right? Or have had voters pass an ordinance, but years after, right, that ballot measure passed, no businesses have opened because the city has essentially sat on the process and has used bureaucracy to impede the opening of these businesses. In some instances has basically flouted, you know, um, public will. I mean, just to give you one example, it's great that these, you know, a couple of dispensaries in Encinitas are now open, but they passed that measure in November of 2020. Right? It wasn't until 2024 that those businesses opened. Similarly, it's great that Costa Mesa now has a few shops open, but for years after they passed that ballot measure over the objections right, of, of city council, um, no, no businesses were open. And so I think, you know, in addition to cities not passing ordinances, there's also an effort to use bureaucracies to stymie the will of voters. 
And I think the other thing that I'll note here is, you know, a lot of these businesses, and this is, you know, I think what is meant by local control, have no, what I would call due process rights, right? They win a license to open up in a city, but hey, you know, you're about to open in a couple of weeks and we're not gonna let you open unless you install this like $200,000 HVAC system, which we didn't tell you about before, right? Cities are essentially allowed to operate unchecked in their dealings with these businesses, such that these cannot be properly understood to be fully legal businesses. And as we were discussing before, right, that means, you got to take years to get a city to pass an ordinance and then you're stymied by bureaucracy right to opening up those businesses at that time you've probably run out of money and so you may not be able to open up those businesses and hey if you're a minority business owner or if you're a small business person then you've definitely run out of money and so i think that's that's how bureaucracy ties together um with with these other issues and you know we have to understand local control in that context that's what local control means in california the ability to ignore your voters and to sort of bureaucratically stifle legal businesses that are, should be allowed to operate in your jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're sort of short on time. I, I want to try to get to the next couple of topics. I, I, I should mention that, you know, delivery is important too. There's the non-storefront retail businesses that are allowed to deliver. There was a huge lawsuit a couple of years ago where uh, a league of cities, 30 or so cities sued the state I think it was the BCC at that time trying to say that this law was uh, interfered with local control because they were allowed to deliver wherever they wanted. Um, it, it, again, it's it's. I, I think the cities should really sort of pick their battles here. Like I, a point I've made a lot is like prohibition didn't work from, you know, all those years up until 2018. Um, why is it going to work now in these cities? Of course, there's a cannabis market in, you know whatever city is is outlawing dispensary is it's just not a legal one it's not one that they can have any tax revenue from so it's it's silly so i i think that they should really pick their battles and either uh allow storefront or at least explicitly allow deliveries but um you know there, there was a lot of resistance to that back then uh I, i'm going to combine the next two topics sort of into one which is uh, the the real actual threats to the industry beyond just the sort of indirect thing everything we've talked about is direct but um the illegal market and in and now what we've seen grown in the last couple of years is intoxicating hemp products which are essentially unregulated so i think that there's essentially three different industries when we talk about cannabis here which is we have the licensed can't maybe four industries actually we have the licensed cannabis industry we have uh compliant hemp producers we have these intoxicating hemp products that often are just completely unregulated and violate state law and then the illegal cannabis market, which is, you know, I read back in 2019 that there were estimates of 3,000 businesses. I would say that number is probably was you know, too small then. It's probably much bigger now. I've heard something like three to four times the size of the legal market. Um, you can read reports this last week all over the internet of, you know, people coming from China and opening crazy illegal weed farms all over the country. It's a huge problem. And it's, it's not just there. I mean, it's everywhere here. Um, and so, it's getting to be an untenable situation and the question and this is something i've written about a lot is what is the state doing to stop it and i think the answer is is effectively very little um every couple of months or years the state passes a new law or creates a new task force or group to combat the illegal market um i think the last one was bonta rob bonta creating some kind of uh program where the attorney general's office would assist local prosecutors and it never really does anything i mean i i looked each quarter at the state's published enforcement data and the amount of search warrants tends to go down i'll give it to the state that they tend to be larger it seems like they're they're going after larger grows um and not you know just these small dispensaries but i don't see why um both things can't happen at the same time. I mean, I'm aware of certain cities in the state that take enforcement against illegal businesses very seriously. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be anywhere near uh, what's happening in other states. I mean, New York just shut down something like 100 illegal dispensaries in the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I think that we, we need some of that. But at the end of the day, I also think that enforcement alone isn't going to do anything. Right? Again, prohibition hasn't solved you know, the, the cannabis problem historically when it was illegal. So it's not going to do it now. I think that if you, without meaningful rethinking of the regulations and um, deregulation in certain areas, people are just going to 
open up another illegal business. I mean, it happens all the time. There are effectively very limited penalties people face. I mean, even though these the city ordinances often have like insane penalties, like thirty thousand a day or something state level too, that's almost never imposed. I think the state only has gone after one company for a fine like that. So um, there are tools that the state can use, uh, and they just aren't used very often. So uh, it's a big complaint. I mean, I, I hear from people all the time. I spent however many millions of dollars to get this business up and running. And there's a guy down the street with an illegal dispensary. Um, and I know when that gets shut down, someone else will open in the same building. So it's hard to explain. This is just, I don't know what else to tell people. Um, first, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but uh, I mean, I'm sure you do. So what, what do you, what do you would like oh, to add? I mean, I, I basically just agree with every, you know, w with what you said, right. Which is that the state has a massive illegal cannabis market problem. It's even hard to estimate how big it is. It might be $10 billion. Nobody knows. Um, I agree with you that enforcement is not the silver bullet that would solve that problem. The primary driver of that issue are, you know, is the very high tax burden that we've discussed and the lack of, of retail cannabis outlets across the state that contributes to the illicit market. And so, you know, those problems need to be solved if the illegal market's going to be solved. Um, I also, you know, if we were to cut California some slack, right, we would say, hey, you know, it has the, the most longstanding illicit market. So, of course, it was going to be hard. And, you know, we might say, hey, you know, California is going to export its cannabis to other states. So, so long as other states remain prohibition states, an illegal cannabis market will exist. So, yeah, I think that's true to some extent. But as you just pointed out, we'd be remiss if we didn't note that California has taken you know, um, a, has taken a different approach than other states, you know, states like Michigan, for example, that also had a longstanding illicit market, but seems to be a little bit more intentional in how it might mitigate it. And look, I, I know enforcement um, is a very sensitive topic because of the history of the war on drugs. And I think it's appropriate that we be sensitive to that. But I'll also say, you know, um, we run the risk of like sort of fetishizing or valorizing the illicit market, right? We should consider the labor exploitation and the sexual abuse that happens um, in, in the illegal sure. market. We should consider the environmental destruction that happens as a result. I think there's a there's a, a tendency to romanticize, maybe that's the right word, the illegal market. But a lot of these values that we say that we care about in California, right? Justice and fair treatment of workers and environmental you know, protection are, are totally undermined by the illegal market. And so I think it's a, you know, we have to be thoughtful about how we approach this issue. And of course, enforcement can't be the primary driver, but to just sort of shrug our, our shoulders at it is does not seem like sound policy. And look, the other thing is it puts a lot of the state's residents at risk, right? If you live outside of these urban centers and you live in a rural area that is terrorized, right, by a lot of these cartels, it's sort of like we're saying, well, those people's lives don't matter. Like it's okay for them to, 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 to deal with that. And, and that seems unacceptable. Yeah, I mean, we talk about uh, murders that have happened in the recent past uh, with these illegal operations, and it's not it's not as uncommon as you would imagine. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that the state has, if you're going to create a regulated market, you have to either disincentivize participation in the unregulated market or incentivize participation in the regulated market. And right now, the state's doing neither of those things effectively. Uh, totally. Um, it's it is impossible to get into this industry without a lot of money. If you're a social equity business, you essentially have to link up with someone with money. And then at the local level, they make it very difficult for that relationship to work well. Um, and it, it leads to disastrous effects. So, I mean, there's just so many ways in which in an ideal world, this could be, you could both increase enforcement against the you know, gangs and cartels and things like that and then decrease regulatory burden on the people who are trying to do it the right way. Um, hemp, the hemp products thing, I think, is, is interesting. Um, we'll talk about that briefly because we only have a few minutes left. But, but you know, basically, when ca cannabis was legalized here, really the big hemp product was CBD. And if you remember at the time, CBD was like regulated by the state via FAQs on the Department of Public Health's website. And just saying like you can't sell it but like it was sold all over the place and again there was a little bit of of enforcement but not much that market seems to have changed when intoxicating cannabinoids hit the scene and do things like delta 8 a thca is another big one um i've written about a lot of these cannabinoids uh quite a bit on our blog i think some of them there are some good arguments for why they're illegal under federal law others i don't like thca i don't agree with those arguments personally in, in most cases 
Um, that might all change federally speaking uh, when the new farm bill is adopted. And again, another thing I've written about, there's efforts to essentially ban in intoxicating cannabinoids. But state law, if you read it closely, I, I think currently does ban a lot of intoxicating cannabinoids uh, in California, yet these, and especially smokable ones, which are not legal to sell here. Um, again, there's, I think, pretty little enforcement. So, um, I, you know, bills like AB 2223 that would open the cannabis market up for hemp products may change that um, by allowing more competitive hemp offerings within the retail license program. But again, like people who want to go to a gas station and buy a vape at three in the morning, um, that stuff's just there and there's not a huge effort to, to remove that. I, I will say it's better here than, you know, I have family in the East Coast and their state's not, they don't have cannabis that's legal. When I go visit them, like everywhere is selling Delta 8. Like every store is, is has Delta 8 and Kratom and all kinds of stuff. And, and so um, it's not as prevalent here, but it is still something where you can you can literally go on websites and have high THCA flower mailed to your house. So you don't even have to get up. And uh, that kind of thing just doesn't exist for cannabis. So again, it's going to be very hard for these businesses to compete. Um, and so that's why you, you see lobbying against hemp at the federal level, which might even be a little overkill, but that's kind of the situation um, the industry finds itself in. Um, yeah. Uh, why don't we jump to the last topic, unless you want to add anything else, but interstate commerce, uh, is it going to happen? Is there a timeline for it? What, what, what do you think it'll do? Yeah, um, I will just say that, um, you know, over the past couple years, there have been many people who have suggested that interstate commerce is imminent or is close, and they have proven to be um, in, incorrect. And um, look, I will also note that... Um, a few things, right? So, so the, the timeline is uncertain, right? Some people believe it's imminent, but you know, those predictions have proven incorrect uh, thus far. The second thing I'll note is it strikes me that just the mechanics of setting up that interstate market, even if there were the political will, will be time consuming, right? How you regulate things like testing and tracking. And I think, you know, the bill that passed in, in California that, you know, sort of led to the memo that was authored by, by Matt Lee from the DCC regarding interstate commerce kind of acknowledge that, right? That, you know, we would have to enter into an agreements with other states along all of these different dimensions. So I think the mechanics um, of it will, will likely be time consuming. Um, there's also the often cited fact that, you know, some other states may not be super interested in participating in interstate, you know, commerce, right? Because it could threaten their industries. I think that political risk remains a very big risk. And I would also say, you know, the assumption that the rest of the country will naturally want California cannabis. I mean, I get it, it makes some sense, but I don't I don't think we can take that assumption at face value, right? There may be um, sort of an interest in regional brands that develop, there may be lower costs of production, um, you know, from cannabis from other states. So, you know, surely there may be some producers who might benefit, some large producers and some craft producers who might benefit from being able to avail themselves of an interstate market. But um, I don't think we should view that as the solution to California's challenges. And right now, California seems intent on a course of making it more difficult for cannabis businesses to operate, say, by increasing taxes next year. So um, is, if the question is, hey, is, is it reasonable to think that interstate commerce is a near term solution to California's challenges? I would say my answer to that would be no. I, I have two points to add to that, which is personally, I think interstate commerce is it's just it's like pie in the sky. And I I don't think it can meaningfully happen unless there's not only federal descheduling, but federal regulation of cannabis that creates some sort of uniform standard. I mean, so to your point about taking time and ex expenses, like the testing and labeling requirement is vastly different among the states. I mean, someone mentioned in the comments the, this new article about testing and pesticides issues. Like the, the, drastically different in other states. And so just harmonizing that, I, don't, I think it's going to be impossible to do without some sort of uniform standard in place. And then like, you know, if we were to get into an interstate compact, um, the proposals have been like Oregon, which also has an, a, a massive oversupply problem. So who's going to really be helped by that? Not us, not Oregon. Um, I think. And so it would need to be with states all over the country, which don't have mature markets or which don't have, you know, which have under supply, which I mean, there just aren't any. So I, I think that it's sort of unrealistic uh, for the time being. I could be wrong, um, but I also just don't think it's really even on the horizon. 
given this the federal state of things and just the, the different i mean truly the amount of differences between california and just like nevada or oregon or it's it's huge so uh in many cases i think those differences are insurmountable um unless states are willing to just say hey look you know you can bring your cannabis into our state without requirement with local regulations and I, I just don't really think that's going to be the case. Um, Hirsch, I, you know, we're, we're running out of time right now. It's it's 1259. I wanted to say thank you for offering your thoughts. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Ananda Strategy. That's A-N-A-N-D-A Strategy. You can find me on Instagram. Um, and you can also go to my website, which is um, AnandaStrategy.com. So that's A-N-A-N-D-A Strategy.com. Well, th thanks, Hirsch, and thanks, everybody, for joining in. Uh, please uh, note that we will be posting this on our website in probably a week or so and uh, also on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch this, please do. Uh, if you want to email us or ask any questions, uh, my email is griffin at harris-slawoski.com, uh, and it's griffin with an E-N, and uh, happy to connect. We'll do this again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.